I will be speaking um, as briefly as possible on um, Egypt's role in the current imperialist game. Um, but I think it's important uh, as Marxists and as people who believe in the dialectics to talk about anti-imperialism as much as we talk about imperialism itself. Because at the end of the day, anti-imperialism, uh, in my view, played a role leading up to the 2011 uh, revolution. Um, under Hosni Mubarak, uh, Egypt has been receiving uh, roughly $2 billion uh, per year, uh, according to the peace treaty uh, that was signed uh, with Israel in 1979. Uh, uh, 1979. Uh, Egypt has been also the second largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid after Israel. From those two billions, 1.3 billion was devoted for the military. The rest was for economic aid. Um, and during times of like disagreements or times when um, foreign aid was a little bit cut down uh, by the Congress or the US presidents, uh, this went down to 1.5 billion to 1.3 billion, but military uh, aid throughout Mubarak's uh, reign remained uh, constant and something sacred. Uh, Egypt's role, according to the imperialist game at the time, was very clear. Um, and no surprise could ever come up or come out of the, uh, uh, the Egyptian foreign policy at the time. Um, Egypt's role was solely limited to, uh, number one, uh, securing the state of Israel. Number two, um, the mediation or negotiations between the Palestinians and the Israelis, Egypt was a central uh, mediator in that process. Number three, maintaining regional stability. Uh, Egypt was central to that. And number four, uh, the protection or the securing of the continuous flow of oil via the Suez Canal. I mean, these were the pillars of the Egyptian foreign policy. Mubarak was not into adventures. The only war that he went uh, on to join was the Gulf War in 1990, 1991, in exchange for uh, the scrapping of all of his military debt. Um, but in the 1990s and 1980s, I mean, Egypt was also going through a dirty war, uh, and a dirty war Latin American style. Uh, where basically the government versus the Islamist militants that we had in Egypt, uh, uh, there was an outright war that also curbed all uh, civil liberties and any sort of democratic rights that we had. Um, I mean, I joined university in the mid-1990s, and as a student activist, I do remember those days quite well, when you could not uh, speak uh, about politics over the phone, when you are at a protest, at best you can talk about the government, but Mubarak's name was a big taboo that you could not even like spell out. What changed uh, the whole game was the outbreak of the second Palestinian Intifada in September 2000. And here I'm, I'm once again stressing the anti-imperialist factors because when, when it broke out, for the first time in probably two decades, we started getting mass protests in the streets of Egypt that were not seen in the previous two decades uh, before. These were solidarity protests with the Palestinians, but very swiftly, the focus changed to the domestic situation. Um, and then comes out the war on Iraq, um, um, and this is a photo from March 2003. This is the first time that Tahrir Square was taken over. I mean, we all know the pictures of Tahrir Square in January 2011, but actually this was the first time that Tahrir Square was taken over. It was when the war uh, uh, on Iraq broke out and thousands and thousands of Egyptians flocked to the streets and took over Tahrir Square in running battles uh, for two days uh, with the police and although the focus was regional, meaning the war, this was the first time that Mubarak's posters were burned down. This was the first time when you heard the chants down with Mubarak uh, very clearly. Such anti-imperialist mobilization 
started to create a room for us in Egypt to start talking about the domestic situation. And this led to the rise of the kifaya or the enough movement in 2004, 2005. Um, kifaya is an Arabic word for the word enough. I think maybe it's, it's, it's already well known information here. Um, and it's not a surprise that most of, if not all of the leaders of the kifaya organizers actually came from the ranks of the anti-war movement and the Palestine Solidarity Movement. That's not a coincidence. Um, such mobilization continued and the Mubarak's taboo started to be completely uh, destroyed. And although Kifaya did not manage, of course, to topple uh, Hosni Mubarak during those two years, and it didn't get much out of its middle class ghetto and the ghetto of the professionals and the students, um, did not extend its roots in the Egyptian working class movement, but it created such a buzz and such an atmosphere that later facilitated the rise of the industrial actions from December 2006 onwards. I remember I had this conversation once with one of the Ghazl al-Mahalla strike leaders. Ghazl al-Mahalla is the biggest textile mill we have in Egypt. Uh, and this photo is actually from their strike in Dece December 2006. And I was asking him, where were you in the years of 2004, 2005, uh, when we were like protesting with Kifaya? And he told me that we were in front of the TV watching those crazy guys burning Hosni Mubarak's posters in Tahrir Square and in downtown. And we were like shocked. But again, this has emboldened us to start striking. So Kifaya had an indirect influence uh, uh, later on such industrial actions, which continued uh, together with many uprisings in the Nile Delta and, and elsewhere. This, for example, is a photo from uh, the 6th of April 2008, when uh, the city of Mahalla in the Nile Delta uh, uh, rose up for two days, uh, mainly triggered by poverty-related reasons and the increase in prices uh, uh, of basic uh, commodities. Such mobilizations continued till January 2011 when uh, the revolution uh, broke out. And I know that many people tried, and many pundits specifically, tried to portray the events in Tahrir Square as solely domestic, triggered by only police torture, uh, triggered by only uh, uh, impoverishment and the new liberal policies that Mubarak uh, uh, was adopting. And it is true, of course, these were like some of the main factors, but anti-imperialism was also present in Tahrir Square. There were uh, uh, banners like these, like this one I took photo of, that says no to Mubarak, no to Suleiman. Suleiman is Omar Suleiman, who was our spy chief then. Uh, both are clients of the Americans. Uh, other banners were also denouncing Hosni Mubarak as, as a traitor and as someone who just implements U.S. foreign policy. In addition to critical banners vis-a-vis uh, -vis his uh, close relations uh, uh, with Israel. And following the, um, um, following, the, following the fall of Mubarak, there were like two years uh, at least of mobilizations that took place in the streets of Egypt over regional issues, whether it's in solidarity with the Palestinians, whether it's in solidarity with other revolutions uh, that were happening uh, in our region. And there was hope among many that with our domestic reform, that also our foreign policy would be reformed. It would be geared more towards supporting uh, our oppressed uh, brothers and sisters across the region and adopting a much more ethical uh, foreign policy. But of course, the coup that happened in July 2013, uh, led by uh, um, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the Minister of Defense, uh, definitely smashed all of these uh, 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 hopes. Uh, however, very, it's very interesting to see how Egypt's foreign policy in terms of the imperial game also started to change uh, with the coup. I mean, in the beginning, with the election of uh, Trump, um, of course, I mean, there was so much excitement in the CC circles. Uh, for, uh, for them, Trump, as someone 
uh, who's a semi-fascist, uh, who flirts with right-wing populism and extremist ideas, they thought that he's definitely in a much better shape uh, for a closer relations than uh, Obama. I'm not trying to say, of course, that Obama, you know, I mean, was um, such a great Democrat or anti-imperialist or anything. But uh, there was definitely uh, excitement. Especially that, I mean, this is uh, Trump's first mention of the Arab Spring. This is in November 2011, when Egyptians were everywhere in the streets protesting <clears throat> police brutality. This was the second wave of the Egyptian revolution. Now, his take on it back then was Egypt is turning into a hotbed of radical Islam. The current protest is another coup attempt. We should have, we should have never ad uh, abandoned uh, Mubarak. I mean, someone who is definitely uh, pro-stability, his anti-revolutions, uh, you would assume that, you know, I mean, Sisi and others would be completely uh, thrilled with. However, and that's what's the interesting thing, I'll, I'll explain that, I know they are in Arabic. Um, <laughs> however, what's interesting is that despite what you think, the Egyptian foreign policy after the coup is so much independent or relatively more independent from the US foreign policy than the Mubarak's era. Like, you know, I mean, from outside you could think that, oh, maybe Sisi has turned into some anti-imperialist, but that's not the case. Um, basically, um, this is Egypt's external debt. Uh, from June 2013, when the coup happened here, it used to be 43.2 billion uh, dollars. 43.2 billion. In four years, by June 2017, it skyrocketed to 79 billion. And this is the audited ones. I mean, we never know how much is also, I mean, done in secret since we don't have much transparency. Egypt is taking money, or CC has been taking loans uh, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, China, Russia, Germany, Italy, France, Japan, South Korea, World Bank, African Bank, among uh, uh, others. And, but at the same time, his foreign policy is somehow not understood by many. For example, despite all the money that he received from Saudi Arabia, and from the UAE, in addition to their political backing, of course, all throughout the counter-revolution, Egypt's involvement in the Yemen war has been very low profile. I'm not saying that, you know, the Egyptians are not part of it, but it's very, very low profile. And there were, like, reports circulating about the frustration of the Saudis that, you know, that the Egyptians, for example, didn't send ground troops uh, for that. During the squabble, uh, that happened around uh, Hariri when, you know, the Saudis literally hijacked a prime minister and held them hostage in, uh, in their uh, country. Actually, the Egyptians didn't support the Saudi stand uh, in that crisis and lent more towards the French attempts at releasing the hostage, who was basically a prime minister of another country. Um, despite Egypt's long history of sectarianism, anti-Shiite sect sectarianism, an anti-Iranian uh, uh, foreign policy, Egypt is actually a big ally of Bashar al-Assad, who is Syria's ruler, as probably all of you know, and his biggest uh, 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 ally of Iran uh, in the region. While continuing to be a strategic uh, partner with the US, uh, Sisi actually has done something unprecedented. I mean, not only did he sign a $30 billion deal uh, with uh, uh, Putin in order to establish uh, nuclear reactors uh, west of Alexandria, but also, but also he, has, he has signed, there is a draft agreement signed last November to allow the Russians to use Egypt's air bases and air spaces. This is something completely, um, I mean, unprecedented in, in, in our history. So as you can see, he's not completely moving uh, along the US track, but how can we understand this? I mean, you can understand this in, in, in different ways. For me, I think the hegemon, the US, the big thug, the global policeman is basically growing weaker. 
already the power of the U.S. has been declining since the launch of the war on terror under George Bush. And previous speakers have already, I mean, touched upon this. Uh, uh, but so basically, I mean, the big thug who was holding like the leash for all like the rabbit dogs, I mean, he's growing weaker. So on the one hand, like, you know, the dogs are just like running everywhere without uh, his control. Uh, secondly, it seems Sisi's biggest obsession is basically fighting radical Sunni Islam. Uh, uh, that's uh, the main priority, uh, fueled by many things that we can talk about maybe in the discussion. But I will wrap up by basically, I mean, stressing again that as a Marxist, one believes in the dialectics. And things, you know, can never be completely black or completely white. Uh, even when the situation is very dismal, and we are in a very dismal situation uh, in Egypt with 60,000 political prisoners, with more than 5,000 people killed, with a dirty war that's being launched in Sinai and in the Nile Valley where Latin American style people are getting disappeared, people are getting kidnapped, people after being disappeared, they show up in the news as, oh, uh, during a shootout they got killed, but it's a cold-blooded execution, despite all of this, there is mass disillusionment with Sisi. There isn't this massive support that he had in 2013. The ruling class which completely united behind him in 2013 to crush the revolution, not just crush the Muslim Brotherhood, um, there is now like divisions in it, and there is infighting among the security uh, agencies. Maybe our region is going through a cold winter after the Arab Spring, but at the same time, we started this year with anti-poverty uh, protests in Tunisia, in Sudan, and in Iran. How will this play out in the future? We, sh we will know, but I'm still hopeful. And I hope that um, among you, if you are based here in Germany, if you are part of political parties and trade unions, is actually to extend to us solidarity. We don't want German arms coming to Egypt, but we want uh, uh, German solidarity from the German trade unions with their uh, counterparts in Egypt. We want human rights organizers here in Germany to protest and also to extend their solidarity to their counterparts uh, in Egypt. And that's the kind of exchange that we're looking forward to, have, to having with Germany, but not arms. Okay, thank you. I'll stop.